Bangalore Biz Lit Fest, and the theme for the year is Biographies and Indian Business History. <clears throat> they say that the ultimate magic is in creating something out of nothing. Since the honorary consul of Israel was with us in the morning half, there is this Jewish, Jewish mysticism which is called Kabbalah, which essentially says about creating something out of nothing. And, and what, what Kabbalah says is that the greatest magic is the magic in words, creating things out of words. And they end up saying that the entire world was created by the word which was uttered. So we have got two stalwarts over here along with us who are essentially magicians or gods with words, of course. Mr. Gurcharan Das is a management guru, an author, commentator, public intellectual, and columnist. He has authored numerous books, including the international bestseller, India Unbound. He regularly writes for six newspapers in India, and also occasionally writes for the international dailies like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Before becoming a full-time author, he had an illustrious corporate career spanning over a decade. He was the chief executive officer of Procter & Gamble India and the vice president for Procter & Gamble Far East between 1985 and 1992. He was later the vice president and managing director of Procter & Gamble Worldwide. Prior to PNG, he was a chairman and managing director of Richardson Hindustan Limited from 81 to 85. And our second panelist is Lakshmi Subramanian. She pursued her doctoral degree in history in the University of Vishwabharati. She has taught in a number of universities in India and abroad, and for the last seven years has been working in the Center for Studies in, the social, in social Sciences in the capacity of research professor. She has authored more than six major books on economic and cultural history of India. Her special subfields of interest being trade, and social networks in the Indian Ocean, histories of predation, and the social history of music in modern uh, South India. So over to you, sir and Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, he very kindly called me a management guru. Let me quickly tell you what my idea of such a person is. It stands for guru, G-U, good at understanding, and R-U, relatively useless. Uh, good at understanding, but relatively useless. Of course, the problem is that the word is also in my name. <laughs> but it wasn't always so. Until the age of three, my name was Ashok Kumar. But my grandmother suspected that my mother, her daughter-in-law, had given me that name because she thought my mother was secretly in love with a Bollywood actor <laughs> named Ashok Kumar. <laughs> so she took me to a guru, she placed me at his feet, and she told the guru, give this boy a name. And so when he saw me at his feet, he said, of course, Guru Charan Das. So overnight, I was transformed from the prince of happiness, Ashok Kumar, to the humble servant of the feet of the guru. <laughs> of course, I think the guru was sending a message also. And in my time, I have been fortunate to have met a number of leaders in business and in the political realm in the last, particularly in the last 20 years after I took, um, after I quit the corporate world. And uh, I find that these people had two or three qualities in common. The first quality was not intelligence, determination, willpower. Second quality was, again, not intelligence, but humility. But humility didn't mean they were not ambitious. They were fiercely ambitious. But their ambition was for their project, their company, and not for their stock options only. 
And the third quality, of course, is integrity. And I'm, I'm laboring this point because nothing to do with what we are going to talk about. But I'm laboring this point because we make the mistake. You notice I didn't men mention intelligence. We overvalue, the, we overvalue thought. We overvalue intelligence. When somebody comes for an interview, for when we are recruiting somebody, we are looking for intelligence. Well, the person has stood first in class at IIM Bangalore, and why are you looking for intelligence? We should be looking for attitude, determination. So hire for attitude and give them skills. You cannot give them attitudes. Attitudes are set at the age of three, and you can't change them. <coughs> Anyways, Lakshmi, we are now <coughs> going to talk to you about a very exciting series of books. They are, they've come in this lovely red box, first of all. There are 10 volumes. The 11th volume has also come. And, uh, and I've been privileged to be the general editor of this series for Penguin. Uh, and it's really a story of Indian business, uh, but told through stories of the romance of the bazaar, the adventure on the high seas, and so on. There's, these, these are, so they've been written by academics, but so they're rigorous, but they are stories written for a thoughtful audience, the kind we have here today. Underwear. Now, I'm not going to ask you how many of you are wearing underwear, but the wearing of underwear is a very modern phenomenon. In fact, it began with when the East India Company, one of our volumes here, let me pull it out. One second. One of our volumes is Penguin Books, Volume 3. East, on the East India Company. And what it tells us is that Europeans, it began with the European aristocracy. For the first time, they saw through the East India Company's trade fine Indian cotton, muslins from Dhaka. And before, they had only coarse cotton, they had coarse wool, totally unsuitable for underwear. But when they found it, first it was the aristocracy, then it were the middle classes in the 19th century, and then in the 20th century, the masses, and it became a global phenomena. So this is just one example of the type of stories that you'll find in this series. Another example here that uh, Tirthankar Roy at, from LSE, he tells is the story of the, you know, the first voyage of the East India Company. The first voyage was not successful in India. They, they couldn't sell anything to Indians, and uh, they came down to, the, to Sumatra. And there in Sumatra, they arrive, and they see a Portuguese ship laden with spices, with watering mouths. They climb up the mountain at night and go to the king's palace. And at the palace, they <coughs> get an interview with the king. And they say that, look, don't trust these wretched Portuguese. They are fleecing you. We will give you a much better deal, the English. And they said, what do you want? You tell us what you want, and we'll give it to you. And they say, we, I, the king says, I want an English woman. I will make her my queen. And so they said, fine, no problem, we'll bring you two. And so they, but they said, now ignore what we are going to do tonight. And so they go down and they bomb this ship of the Portuguese, but protect the cargo that's there. They kill all the Portuguese put the cargo into the East India ship, and they go back home. And in London, they make a 1,520% profit because there's no cost to this, this 
and then they advertise for an English woman to be the queen of Sumatra. 420 women apply. They select 10 because they think some will die on the way to the, in the journey. They arrive in Sumatra and they've got two English women for the king and that's how the East India Company's fortunes started. So this is just one volume. I give you an example. Before, sh before I bring in Lakshmi, I want to give you ki a kind of a overview of this. Our first volume was Arthashastra, which again is written by a great scholar of the Arthashastra, Thomas Troutman at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And he, and Arthashastra means the science of wealth. Of course, it's advice to the king. And one of the advices or counsels that the king receives from Kautilya is make sure you don't tax people too heavily. Otherwise, they'll go to the next kingdom. And so what he's saying is that first, don't try to be like the Chinese emperor who owns the land. Here, you don't own the land. You have a share for giving law and order, for building infrastructure, and so on. <clears throat> and you have a share for that, only if you deliver. And your share is Shat Bhaga. And Shat Bhaga means one-sixth, which means 15%, which is the tax rate of Singapore today. So the just tax rate as defined not only in the Arth Shastra, but also in the Mahabharat, in the Shanti Parva. Again, the king is told, Bhishma says to Yudhishthir, your share is one sixth. Moving on. Uh, my favorite book is called The Mouse Merchant. The Mouse Merchant is the author, by the way, is a Bangalore girl, Arshia Satar, who wrote that wonderful translation of the Mahabharat. And the story of the mouse merchant is wonderful. It's the story. Can I get up? I think I feel a little bit better on my feet. S yeah, shall I just go? Oh, no, I'm, I'm, is it? Oh, one second. Okay. Uh, so it's a poor boy, 14 years old. His mother cleans houses for a living, and she's determined that her son will be better than her. And so she tells the boy, look, your father is dead, but you will live up to the reputation of your father. And so she says, go to that house over there that's the richest man in town. And you wait to see what he's going to do and learn from him. So this boy goes there. While he's waiting for this rich merchant, um, he sees a dead mouse on the ground. And so the merchant comes out and the boy uh, says, can I please have that dead mouse? And the merchant takes, laughs course, you're doing me a favor. Most people come here wanting a favor. And he says, well, do you want something else? And the boy says, no, thank you. He takes the dead mouse. He has a neighboring, a, a woman in the neighborhood who has a cat. So he sells the mouse as cat food. She gives him a few paisa. He goes to the bazaar, buys chana, gram. And he makes little puriyas of the chana and takes water and goes and sits on the town square. In the afternoon, loggers come. They're going to the timber market. They're coming from the forest, carrying logs of wood. <coughs> They're all tired, so he offers each one a glass of water and chana. They are very grateful. They have no money, so each of them gives him a log. So the next day he sells a log and he makes, gets more chana and more water and he's got into business. 
and within three months, he has a lot of logs in his house. And then the monsoons come, the logging stops, the market, timber market prices shoot up, and that's when he starts selling his logs, and he makes a killing, and then he goes, and with that money, he buys a timber shop, and he becomes a timber merchant, and after a few years of very successful business, he realizes the margin is not very high in timber trading. So, but there it's very high in building a ship and selling it. So he finds a shipbuilder, makes him his partner, starts building ships, very successful, becomes a very rich man. And then he realizes it's not just the big money is also in transporting people on the ships as well as cargo. And so he gets into the shipping business. By 22, he has become the richest man in the town. So he goes to the jeweler, asks to, he builds, I tells him to make me a gold mouse. So he makes a gold mouse of 24 karat gold and he goes and presents it to that rich merchant. And he tells him his story from the dead mouse, all that has happened. And that man is flabbergasted. And he gives his daughter in marriage to this boy. <laughs> so that is the story of the mouse merchant. But the point is that the merchant in the ancient India was a respected figure, not after 1950, when we had our socialist period, when a merchant became an object of contempt. So in this way, we have lots of stories, and I think what I'll do is, I'll just tell you one more, and then we'll save, Lakshmi and I will have our discussion on her book, Three Merchants of Bombay. And, but I will just close for the moment by telling you the story of this book. This is Marwadi's by Tom Timberg. It was his PhD thesis at Harvard, and he's written a, a lovely book from Jagat Seth to the Birlas. And one of the things that I'm struck with is the fact that uh, 64 countries did the same reforms that India did. But why did India become the second fastest growing economy in the world? Because we had, when we did the reforms, we had business communities in our midst. We had people like the Marwadis, the Kachis, the Chetiars, the Boras, the Parsis. And this, if you do reforms Chip. in a society, where you already have, if you do reforms in a society, that's better. <clears throat> I don't have to shout. If you do reforms in a society where people already know how to conserve capital, to grow capital, you have a head start. And so this, I just want to tell you one little story which I recount, not Tom Timber recounts, but I recount in my introduction. I've done long introductions, by the way, to each of these books, and where I've, as Lakshmi will testify, I have not repeated what the author is saying, but try to make it exciting for the reader to want to dip into the book. So for me, the exciting story of the Marwaris is the story of Ramakrishna Dalmia. He was 22 years old, 1931, depression. Clouds were there in the world. And he lived in one room in Calcutta with 11 relatives of his own. His grandfather, his father, his mother, his, children, his son, his wife, everybody. And it cost 14 rupees a month to rent that room. And his mother was after him. 
Ram, why don't you just get a job for 100 rupees a month and we'll be happy. But he was a Marwadi. Marwadis don't go and get jobs for 100 rupees a month. So what does he do? He gets a tip that the silver market is about to explode. So he tries to scrounge all the money he can get, picks it up from friends, etc., on, on debt, sells his wife's bangles or pawns them, and puts everything into the silver market in London. <clears throat> and after three days, the market crashes. And he is a dead dog. He has no friends left. He hasn't told his family what he has done. He doesn't know how they're going to feed themselves or have a shelter next month. And he's down in the dumps. He goes to a, a astrologer, a rich astrologer. And he goes and tells him, you, you predicted that I was going to be a rich man, the richest man in India one day. And the fellow says, wait a minute, let me look at your hand again. He looks at his hand. Yes, yes, you're going to be very rich. The guy says, look, you know what's happened to me. What kind of astrologer are you? Anyway, so he's leaving very downcast, leaving the house. But he says, by the way, before he leaves the room, he turns back and he says, why don't you? I've got a tip again. The market's now going to go up, the silver market. So put some money. You're a rich man. And the fellow says, okay, let's put 10,000. At that time, 10,000 rupees was equal to 10,000 pounds. The exchange rate was one to one. And uh, the next day, the servant of the astrologer says, the astrologer doesn't want to gamble. Sorry, we cannot honor that yesterday's word. He says, but I've already sent the telegram. You've bought 10,000 rupees worth of silver. The uh, servant says, sorry, that's your problem. We are not going to honor. This guy is in further, another doghouse. And so he's pacing around, walking the streets of Bara Bazaar and Calcutta and everywhere, and goes by the Ganges and all, does Shnan. And then, in a couple of days, the market does begin to climb. So within a day, all his, he had lost, has been recovered, including the 10,000 that he had put in. But then, being a <laughs> Marwadi, what does he do? <coughs> he steals another bangle of his wife and hawks, uh, pawns it and puts more money. Well, within three weeks, he has become the richest man in India. He goes, he buys 10 bungalows in Lutyens, Delhi. Even today you know, this is the Dutch embassy. Many of these are embassies. Beautiful bungalows. Plus Dalmia cement, Dalmia paper, Dalmia sugar, Dalmia airways. He has become, and I don't know whether you guys will remember this, but when, we were ch when I was a child, people used to mention three names, Tata, Bidla, Dalmia, in those days. Well, now here is a story of what, why the Marwadis are so successful. And that is their amazing appetite for risk taking. Okay, so Lakshmi, we'll, we'll keep half the books to, for later. But let's begin our conversation. I'm very fortunate that we have at least one author of these books here today with us. Lakshmi is in Calcutta. And she has written this book called The Three Merchants of Bombay, Business Pioneers in the 19th Century. And so, Lakshmi, who are these three merchants of Bombay and why did you choose them? Okay. Uh, shall I? Yeah. Thanks, Gurcharan. First, a very quick thank you to the organizers for enabling my visit here. And I have had the opportunity of listening to very interesting sessions. So in some of the answers to the questions that Gurcharan will pose, I will reflect 
on some of the issues that came up, particularly in the first two panels. But to answer you first, I have three protagonists. My first protagonist is Arjunji Nath Trivadi, who is a Nagar Brahmin of Surat. He is roughly between 1740 and 1813. My second protagonist is the Parsi merchant, also Gujarati speaking, Jamsedji Gigi Boy, pioneered the China trade, pioneered the trade in opium, extremely important as a figure, both as a philanthropist, but also as the builder of modern Bombay, and very keen on the idea of the public and the private. And the third protagonist is Prem Chand Raichand and Oswal Jain, again coming from Surat, speculating in cotton, huge cotton boom, reclamation, stocks and shares, and embodying a very different moment of business. So these are my three merchants. And very quickly, let me also put in a caveat as to why did I uh, use a biographical approach to studying Bombay? And I think it's a question that will reflect on a lot of the things that were said in the morning. I actually believe that having a biographical optic is helpful in uh, in making the structure of history a little more interesting. So while we have the larger structural history, which is the staple of historians, I think adopting a biographical approach gives us an insight into the episodic, into the contingent, into fortune, into that chance, which is so important, I think, in understanding human destiny. So Lakshmi, the hero of your story, though, although it's a story of three merchants, I think of your, the hero of your story is Bombay, is Mumbai, as we call it today. Why did Bombay become the premier port of India, displacing Surat, and why did it become a global trading hub? What was its competitive advantage? Yeah, yeah that's, that's actually a very good question. I mean, I... Uh, have been born and brought up in Calcutta, and I've had a healthy appreciation of 19th century Calcutta and its tryst with modernity. But business obviously is not one of Calcutta's USB. So I was attracted to Bombay partly because it's always been represented as, you know, London of the Dick Whittington type. Here is a place where you make money. Here is a place which is rife with opportunity. And in many ways, Bombay is the protagonist of my story. And this is so because, of course, you had locational advantages. You have a natural harbor. But I think the most important advantage is, one, it was able to support and sustain a multiracial, multi-ethnic business community. Here is a city which is really multi-ethnic as far as the 18th and the 19th century is concerned. That's one. Secondly, I think this is very important, and I know and I completely agree with one of the speakers we had in the morning that we need not blame the British Raj for everything, but I think it's very important to remember that Bombay escaped the colonial onslaught by 40 years. So in many ways, structurally, Bombay could support resilient indigenous financial and manufacturing activity much more than other states. And thirdly, and I think this is equally important, I think that communities who came into Bombay in the late 18th and 19th centuries were very quick to adjust to the contractual facilities that the mayor's court and the court, court institutions in Bombay were able to provide for them. So in many ways, I will say that Bombay really becomes the gateway to a different kind of modernity. And uh, as, you, as you mentioned, what struck me the most actually was that before Bombay, you really, merchants depended on uh, trust. They still depend on trust. Trillions of dollars are transacted every day and everybody doesn't draw a contract for every thing that you transact. But it's like your taxi driver. You get into the taxi, he thinks you'll pay him at the end. He doesn't start asking you first, Do you, are you liquid? Do you have the liquidity? He doesn't ask for a bank statement or anything. Well, this is the point. I think Bombay brought the rule of law to India, commercial law. And I'm going to talk to you in the end about this book called Commercial Law in Medieval India. And, and actually it's based, the law before the British came, the law that operated in commercial terms, it, out of the Dharma Shastras, 
this this thing has been done so anyway let's move on so one of your heroes as you say is jamshed ji 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 boy so first tell us how did he become a player in this golden triangle trade between london bombay and hong kong and how is it that what that, what the, you know that uh, we that uh, classic uh, quote of uh, tan chung who says chinese tea for the british indian opium for the chinese british raj for the indians so illustrate that yeah that's that's a good quote actually um if i were to talk about why jamshed ji um i think it would be a little unfair if we simply make him of course he's a great hero he's a great protagonist he's a fabulously wealthy successful merchant but i think we must position him within the larger parsi community that was able to make very substantial advances in the island city i mean he's part of a community that has actually uh um, moved from artisanship to small manufacturing to trade and then to industry and entrepreneurship so i think jamshed ji comes from that community which is able to draw from community values of artisanship and capital accumulation is suitably placed with very interesting personal relations with several european private traders and agency houses some of whom one of whom william jardin he meets in a ship completely by chance they become great friends and then when he decides to enter this opium trade jardin becomes his principal you know in this agency house business so i think it's both serendipity but also uh, drawing from this cultural inheritance of the parsi community that positions jamshed ji to occupy that role but i think it's equally important for us to remember that jamshed ji enters the trade of bombay at a moment when the english east india company and its private servants are you know are looking for an opportunity to one remit their profits to london two to manage to get capital in canton to buy tea for which there is a tremendous demand thanks to pits india act of 1783 when duties on tea actually come down there is this huge market so because of the requirement of remittance money for capital for raising your cargo you have this multilateral trading arrangement and jamshed ji is able to play that role of being able to provide the europeans cotton from gujarat brooch surat and opium from malwa so malwa opium and cotton both of which he is able to access because of that multiracial environment that i talked about a few minutes ago one of his closest friends is a marwadi up country who lives in malwa and provides him the best crop available for export so it's wonderful you know right now we are complaining in india about demand every industrialist is being asked by the government why are you not investing and the fellow said but i already have excess capacity why should i build another factory demand is the starting point and it was demand the as, as lakshmi says that the british got hooked to tea then they didn't know so they got the tea but they didn't know how to pay for it because the chinese didn't want anything that they made so how were they going to pay for the tea and then this brain wave comes about that the chinese are hooked to opium so first they start growing opium in bihar and then in malwa and then of course the whole thing takes off of course we we, we shouldn't try to condemn now you know using 21st century values about selling opium and drugs in you know you'll be today you'll be in trouble um <clears throat> another hero of yours lakshmi is actually my favorite and that is premchand roy chand a gujarati jain who illustrates how bombay became a global hub so tell us about the link between abraham lincoln in america and 
Premchand Roy Chand's fortune in India and how did Roy Chand become the king of cotton and how did the cotton boom collapse bringing down with it everybody the whole city collapsed for a while including the famous Bank of Bombay Thank you. Um, I think um, Premchand Roychand is also, a, uh, I wouldn't say he's exactly a favorite of mine, but he was a person whom I found the hardest to write about. And, you know, I will finally, if we have the time, reflect on the importance, therefore, of database, repositories, archives to do business history, serious business history. Uh, so it was difficult to write about Premchand. Now, I think what is really interesting about Premchand Roychand's life and labors in Bombay is uh, it demonstrates really what an integrated global economy can do. So when you have the American Civil War and American cotton supplies are no longer available to the industries in Britain, Manchester and Lancashire, which is dependent on the fine raw cotton staple of the United States because Lincoln's fighting slavery and that's the point at which the English realize, and of course the Gujaratis being canny businessmen also realize, that Surat brooch, Central Indian and Western Indian cotton can provide a substitute for American cotton to continue to fuel and continue to support English industry. So it's at that point you have an extraordinary speculation in cotton you have hundreds of pounds, hundreds of thousands of pounds being invested in cotton and Premchand Raichand and his father are able to, you know, able to ride that wave of speculation. But cotton is just one. Of course, it's, the, yeah. Every panwala in Bombay was also investing That's in right. cotton. Yeah. yeah. A cotton exchange sort of just went berserk. It sort of went over the roof. But what is interesting is that along with cotton, you, it, this, this sort of coincides with a period when there is enormous urban building in Bombay. This is the time also that you have massive reclamation companies that are being floated, the Back Bay Company building, you know, if you think of the Horniman Circle, that's the time. This is the time when the city is actually being built. And so along with cotton, along with land, along with speculation, you have a series of companies that are floated. Everyone's buying and selling shares with a frenzy that really is marked. And you just have to read some brilliant contemporary memoirs of you know, Dinesh Vacha, who writes this beautiful memoir, Shells in the Sands of Bombay, to get a sense of how the city really completely lost it. And of course, the Bank of Bombay, which was a huge investor in all of this, was not regulating it effectively. So Premchand makes a 